aren't we? I'm so glad you could see it. Um, I'd like to introduce to you, um, we have two folks here from the League of Women Voters, and they're going to do a small presentation, and then we're going to have a discussion together about voting and voting rights and what's going on right now today. Introduce yourselves, please. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sherletta McCaskill. I am the Vice President for Communications for the League and also the Chair of the Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Committee. I've been involved with the League for the past two and a half years. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm, I'm Diane Burroughs. I am the recent uh, past president of the League of Women Voters of the City of New York, and I now serve as Chair of the Speakers Bureau and I also chair the internship program. So we just wanted to just, before we get started, just kind of give everybody a few basic facts about the upcoming election. We've got some really important things on the ballot that we wanted to make sure everybody was aware of. First of all, of course, we're past the deadline for voter registration now, but you can check your status, you can find out where your poll site is, find out the hours, of voting by going to vote.nyc, which is the Board of Elections website, or going to the League website, which is vote411. And when you go to either one of those, you'll be able to really make sure that your voting action plan is all set to implement, knowing where, when, and of course, making your voting decisions. Um, on the ballot this time, we are going to have, in addition to all the candidates on your ballot, there go, there's going to be a state proposal and three city proposals. The New York State proposal is called the Clean Water, Clean Air, and Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act of 2022. Now this bond act is going to authorize the sale of state bonds up to $4 billion, $200 million to fund environmental protection natural restoration, resiliency, and clean energy projects. The League of Women Voters, State of New York, has endorsed this. We think it's a great idea, and we are supporting it. On the city level, if you're a city voter, there are going to be three proposals on the ballot that all come out of the Racial Justice Commission. And they are, the first one, will add a preamble to the New York City Charter that would be a statement of values and visions aspiring toward a just and equitable city for all New Yorkers. So that's proposal number one of the city proposal. Proposal number two will establish a racial equity office, plan, and commission. And ballot prop number three is going to measure the true cost of living to track the actual cost of living in New York, especially focused on essential needs such as housing, food, childcare, transportation, and any other necessary expenses, separated from any public or private assistance that might be offered. So this is a true cost of living. We at the City League have voted to accept this and to endorse it. So we believe this is the right way to go here in the city. So we support that. It's important to know that on your ballot, when you get your ballot, whether you vote early, you vote absentee, or you vote on traditional election day, the propositions are on the flip side. So you want to tell everybody you know, flip your ballot, because the proposals are always on the back. All the candidates are on one side, flip it over, and that's where you're going to find the proposals. Each one of them is a separate yes or no. So that's really important. And you could find out more, again, at Vote411, and you can read the actual, um, the actual wording of it at Vote.NYC as well. So that's the basics on the ballot. So what we want to do now is, as Susan B. Anthony said, we're going to light the fire. <laughs> we're going to light the fire. So let's talk a little bit about why this matters. Why does this matter? Why do elections matter? Why does voting matter? Sherletta. <laughs> well, when that, um, you know, ball was struck out of the, uh, the hit out of the park, voting matters because that's what we got. In a nutshell, that's, that's the best way I can put it. It's what we had, okay? 
um, some folks maybe want to, you know, take up arms and, you know, and uh, force the government to be what it wants it to be. But the majority of us uh, don't want to worry about, you know, packing our a AR-15 and or our block, you know, and marching up to uh, City Hall to, you know, to kick the mayor out. That's not what the majority of people are doing. So it's what we have, and that's why it's important, because if we don't have it, then we got nothing. We have nothing. So that's why it's important, in my, in my, my opinion. And especially right here and right now, because as you know, um, the next election coming up and the one after that may determine whether or not we keep our democracy. So it's what we have for now. And you know, I think when we talk about how to deal with explaining this and encouraging people to use their vote, we all come across voters, or not voters yet, people who should be voting, who are either reluctant to vote, or they're angry and disenfranchised, and they feel that their vote doesn't count. And we have to have ways to talk to them, and to really try to get them to understand the power of their vote. And I think one thing that I try to do when I work with folks, you know, young people, especially college students or young people who have been disenfranchised, is to really give them concrete examples, especially on the local level. Because on the local level is where your voice has the most power. So when you think about things like to say to somebody, what do you care about? What's your passion? What in your community needs fixing? And it might be something like, we need more trees, or we need another playground, or there's too much trash. Your voice as a voter is what allows you to have a say in that, and to feel that you have a voice. You're right, 100%. So I think that, you know, think about yourselves. When you hear people say that, what are some ways that you respond to people who give you that, that, that express that feeling to you? Any thoughts? Yeah. Oh, here, go ahead. I almost don't want to speak, but I'm going to. I have become so disgusted with the voting on a local level, and I don't mind naming her name. I voted for Carlina Rivera because she said she was going to vote against the tech hub. As soon as she got in, she changed her vote. Now, what do you do about something like that? I'm 69 years old. I have no, I will follow her around for the rest of her life or my life and stand up and call her a liar because that's what she did. She lied. I also am very, um, distressed about the fact that there is no vi viability to third parties. And I, I am not a Democrat anymore. And, and um, I, I thought what Nancy Pelosi said last week about the, the, the um, immigrants coming in from the border, well, we need them here to pick fruit. I mean, I, I, I just, what an elitist. I mean, I just, I, I'm just totally disgusted. I mean, so I'm becoming a social, I am a socialist, but I'm gonna start <laughs> voting as a socialist. And what I'd like to ask you is, what can, what can your organization do to give more viability to the socialists? So first of all, the League of Women Voters, we are a nonpartisan organization. <laughs> so we start with that. But, but you know, you are expressing a very honest and open emotion that really is, is very, people feel this, and it's real, and it's honest. And the response really is, we were talking about this before, we have the ability, you had, you, somebody got voted in in your district, you're not happy with them, Next time around, we vote them out. There's a certain level of patience that's tied into this. And certainly, Susan B. Anthony, you know, we talk about patience and the epitome of it. And our obligation is to work together, form coalitions, and work to 
get people to understand the power of their vote. That if we're not satisfied with the way a candidate became an elected official, our obligation is to get that person out. Now, one thing just to add on to that, the League of Women Voters, what we believe is everything is based upon really three pillars. Voting, advocacy and lobbying, and community involvement. And what you were expressing really fits under that category of advocacy work. Once we elect somebody, we're not done. Right, exactly. Then comes the hard work of reaching out to them, going to their office, calling them out if we need to, and saying, this is what you said, we need a piece of legislation on X issue, and this is our expectation from what you promised. And so by using our, our voice as advocates and lobbyists, and then the third pillar, community involvement, getting involved in the community, even if you're not an eligible voter, to get involved in community action, demonstrations, joining a group, getting politically active, is there, a, is there a committee or an order, part of your organization that trains people to do this? As a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> because, it, you know, uh, I'm saying this yes. because we, we all feel these emotions right now. Right. I, I know I am. Every day I'm up there and I'm like, I just like what you're saying, and thank you for sharing that. And I, I just want to have some action. My yes. action is through my theater. Right. But I know I need to do more. I love telling stories, and I love telling Toby's story here. Mm -hmm. But, but I know I need to get trained. Yeah. So I can go to my representatives and say, I don't like this, or I do like this, or right. you, need, you're, you need to, I'm paying your bills. Yes, <laughs> you need exactly, to. Right. exactly. Do you want to talk about the Returning Citizen Project and what we're doing with those folks? So uh, the lead happened to get a bit of a, uh, a bit of a, uh, I'm worried my brain is frozen. <laughs> A bit of a um, grant. Thank you. <laughs> they got a small grant to reach out to folks who are returning citizens uh, who are formerly incarcerated to educate them about their voting rights and also to uh, help them to learn to advocate for themselves for whatever issues they find important, um, you know, in reaching out to their elected officials. So, as a part of that, we do teach a civics one on one, if you will, educating folks about the branches of government, just that basic and then taking them through the steps of how you actually organize and form coalitions to speak about the issues that are of concern to you so that you can have an impact on those elected officials and the outcomes um, in terms of legislation that you seek to have. Or in fact, you know, maybe you can even run for office yourself or support others who uh, do have your point of view. So that's what the Returning Citizens Project is, is doing. But it's also been a part of the uh, well, of the Civics 101 training that Diane has been a part of for a very long time. So the, the League actually has those tools and that workshop available for folks to participate in so that they can learn the step-by-step -step process of how to make that happen. Yeah. So, you know, when you think, yeah. when, we, when we started working on the Returning Citizen Project, you know, that group of folks talk about being disenfranchised and alienated, you know, to, to get everybody to understand that you do have a voice. And so by creating these workshops on civics education for adults, you know, we've been able to teach people how to go about this. And it's so interesting because one of the responses we always get, we'll talk about, you know, you pick up the phone and you call your city council person's office to make an appointment to go in to talk about an issue. And we've had people in our program say, really, you can do that? You're allowed? You can call your city? Yes, they work for you. You hired them by voting for them. So very powerful. And we do have to teach people that because we don't people don't know that. They don't know that they have that right. Yeah, civics education in, in this country is going down the tubes for quite a while. <laughs> um, because they don't teach that in school to you know to kids anymore, unless maybe they're in a specialized high school for that sort of thing. So civic ed education is what how I know how to do these things. Because when I was growing up, that's what we were taught in school. And it was, and I, I tell this all the time, my pops was a preacher. So, you know, it kind of like comes with my DNA because, you know, he would take folks to the, to the polls, uh, help people to register to vote, 
Uh, and so that's been a part of, you know, of, of who I am, you know, growing up as a kid down south. <coughs> you know, my grandfather was a preacher, so it's kind of like it runs in a family. You know, this kind of thing is a, a family business, if you will. So it's kind of like I don't have a choice. You know, this is what I, I, I learned how to do. This is what I do. So, but I, I do know that the, uh, the younger generations, like I said, have no way the, the exposure or experience that we all have had in terms of, you know, seeing uh, politics and, and um, events unfold in front of us, you know what I'm saying, that uh, they changed our culture and they changed our society. And as we were talking just a little bit earlier, young people now kind of grow up in an instant everything age. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have everything at their fingertips, uh, the, the internet and you name it, TikTok and all the, all the rest. And if it's not happening in 30 seconds, they don't want to be bombed. Mm -hmm. So this is the challenge, I think, for us uh, at the league mm -hmm. and, and, and going out to communities who are disenfranchised, you know, folks of color and, and returning citizens and, and the rest, to say that, listen, as Diane first said at the beginning, and this is very, very important, folks are disenfranchised because on a national, on a federal level, it's kind of like, you know, for example, Running for president, guess how much that costs? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have run for president, it's going to cost you a billion bucks. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to get that money? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be thinking about mom and pop you know, in, in, in your hometown. You're not going to be thinking about the rank and file voter. You're going to think about serving the people who are paying those bills. So that's why when, I, when we talk about politics and elections, as you said, Diane, it's very crucial to get people to see right where they are that that's the most important vote that they have. That's why it matters that they vote. That's why it matters that their voices are heard. That's why it matters that they learn to use their voice. Because, you know, even if you're on welfare, let me say this, you're still a taxpayer, and I'll tell you how. When you go to buy something, you pay tax on it, okay? Yeah. So that's why people need to understand local, local politics is everything, you know what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> like, like Diane said, if you want, you know, that playground, if you want more, you know, for example, we, with the participatory budgeting, yeah. um, you know, I, I want a pool in my neighborhood because there's not one there. I live in the uh, north central section of the Bronx, and there's not a pool nearby. So, participatory budgeting says, well, you can't have a pool, <coughs> excuse me, but you can have swimming lessons for the kids, and then hire younger young people to train those uh, kids to learn how to swim, and then you know you can have that money go to you know, poor kids who, who need a job for the summer. So there's all kinds of ways to be involved in your community on the local level that truly make a difference. And so that's why we try in, in reaching out to, you know, to younger folks and particularly people of color to say, listen, yeah, we know, you know, being you know, president maybe not matters to you or senator may not matter to you, but did you know that your community board is three blocks from here? Mm -hmm. Did you know that you could go to your community board and be on a committee? Mm -hmm. Did you know that your voice really matters and what happens on your block? So that's what we're, we're hoping to engage younger people with and folks who are disaffected and disenfranchised. And as Diane said earlier, in terms of party affiliation, obviously we're not in that business. Um, but in terms of just to speak to what you said about the, the stranglehold, if you will, that we are in this two-party system, that's because of M O N E Y, just the bottom line. You know, it's because of money. And so I, I often I like the model that they have in Europe, where campaigns are publicly financed, well, yeah. you know, and that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of laws, right, that we should be pushing for to make our process more democratic and more more transparent. You know, there, I, I had a great story. Um, I was with a, one, actually my city council person several years ago, with a group of people, some young people, some of our interns actually. And we were in there to advocate on an issue with our city council person. And we had a wonderful conversation with her. And at the end of the conversation, she said to us, and I'll never forget this, she said, if I have 10 constituents come to me with an issue, that puts it on my radar. 10. Each city council person represents 160,000 people. And she's saying 10 of them make a difference to what I do as a city council person. And that goes to the power of our voices on a local level. And then you think about that, and then it bubbles up. So now we have impact on the local level. Pretty soon it bubbles up, and now some of those city council people run for state assembly or state senate. And that bubbles up, and we keep going. 
but it's got to be deliberate, it's got to be thoughtful. What can we do? The, another perfect example in my neighborhood, we had trash all over, on every corner. It was disgusting. And the community board got together and got the city council, city council person in our district, to buy those trash cans that have the lid that just have the opening in it. And I use it when I talk to young people and I show them a picture of this trash can. And I say to them, it might seem silly in this class to show you a picture of a trash can, but this trash can represents the voices in my community being heard. And now when you look at this picture of this trash can, there's no garbage on the street. And, yeah, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that's the thing about it. People think politics is this gigantic amorphous thing. But when you break it all down, like I said, that person who became president, who became senator, who became, you know, governor, they started somewhere. They didn't start out in office as the governor. They didn't start running for governor from day one. They began at the local level, whether it's school board, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that sort of thing. They started at the local level, and that's what people need to uh, need to take away. That really, local politics is everything. Um, I, just just quickly, I worked for Gail Brewer at doing an internship, um, you know, a few years ago, and she trained us when we answer the phone, you take that person's address and what their issue was, why they were calling. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that they pay attention. Like I said, the squeaky wheel will get yes. the order. Yes. Well. It even on the school board, as a parent, you can be active and change things. Mm -hmm. I was part of the small school movement in New York City. In other words, the special, not specialized, but small schools mm -hmm. um, and little, little magnet schools. And uh, I was part of the founding, I was a founding parent in the Brooklyn New School because we, we had these schools that were very segregated. Mm -hmm. In this neighborhood, everybody was white and upper middle class. And what we wanted to do was to have people from all over our district, and the kids have all different kinds of um, interactions with different people, okay? So we started these new schools, and it was called the Brooklyn New School. But I never knew about that. I grew up as an artist. I grew up as, you know, a theater maker. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm in the playground, and this woman comes over to me and says, can you please sign my petition? We want to have a, you know, a school where everybody's included. And it was that, that little thing of, of a parent coming up to me that I got involved in the small school movement. And I was a founding parent at the Brooklyn New School, which is now like jumped off and there these these schools are all over our city now. And that was 30 years ago. And it's <laughs> something as small as that of some signing someone's petition and then having a conversation with them. Yeah. Oh, really? That that how can I get involved? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is grassroots. It I is. think we have to change mm -hmm. from the grassroots. And for in New York City, you don't even have to be a citizen to serve on a community board right. and to get involved in participatory budgeting. You only have to be 11 years old, right? Mm -hmm. so on that, literally, you can be 11 years old and be a part of, of participatory budgeting under the new plan in the city and, and, and vote for that, for that uh, um, service that you chose for that um, participatory budgeting activity. So, you know, and certainly in community groups, you don't have to be a citizen. So all of these pillars, again, voting, advocacy and lobbying, community involvement, it really, you can't say, oh, well, you know, I'm not old enough to vote, I can't be involved, or oh, I'm not a citizen yet, I can't be involved. No, you can be. And the more grassroots it is, the more your voice can be heard. And it sort of becomes addictive, right? You know, you start voting, and we know this for a fact, when people vote in local elections, it's a habit, and they always vote after that. So we always are careful, like we never refer to a presidential election as the be all and end all, and the other elections, like what's happening this year or what's happening next year for right. city council, right. we never say off year election. No, there's no yeah. such thing as off year election. Every election really matters. You mentioned this earlier, but is there any kind, because I've been thinking about this for a while. I agree. Over 100 years. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that elections, we should get 
should should be publicly funded. Right. That yes. we should right. not have the guy who can raise the most money is right. the one who gets elected. That's right. So is the, what is going on in that regard? Is right. anything we, happening The League of Women that? Voters, yes, absolutely. The League of Women Voters and other members of our coalition, Common Cause, ACLU, NYPIRG, all of them, we're all, our state league is working on that in Albany right now to get public funding and a lot of other, you know, working on the I tell you, my, my, I, I mean, I'm, partly because I am just inundated with emails. Uh, and I just too. decided I'm not doing it. And yet they keep coming. And, and I, I just, it isn't because I dislike any of these individual candidates. I just don't think that's how it should work. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear yeah, that. that. Definitely, that's happening. If you go to the League of Women Voters website, State League, it's just lwvny.org, and you'll see all the things that they're working on with election law. So, yeah, and in the city, actually, we have a committee, our election reform committee, chaired by a woman named Bella Wang, and she's amazing. And she does lobbying and advocacy work with her committee on citywide mm -hmm. issues of election law. Yeah. Huh. So definitely, you are on the right track for sure. <laughs> well, just to get an yeah. idea of what, it, what else is on the ballot this year. Depends on where you live, but right. certainly Congress, State Assembly, State Senate, Governor, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor. You probably have some judges, because yeah. you know in New York we elect judges. Mm -hmm. um, what am I yeah. missing? That's about it. And Senate. Thank you. And next year is city council. And then, of course, these proposals will be on the ballot. Oh, next year is city council. They're five years? No, uh, because of the census, after a census, the city council serves a two-year term because right now they're doing redistricting uh -huh. for city council. Oh, so everybody on city council? Yes, because it's being redistricted. And how many people are on city council? 51. Oh, wow. <laughs> or 50, it's hard to get things 50, done, 51. right? Yeah. Mm. So yeah, we every year, every year in New York we have an election. Oh, is there still only one Republican? He's in business. Is there only one Republican in City Council still, or is that? Is there only one Republican in City Council? Oh, Do you I know? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, like I said, we are nonpartisan, so we don't, you know, get into that. Is they are they in City Hall? Where is the City Council? Uh, right now they're on Zoom. Watch them anywhere. <laughs> uh, do the, do yeah, they actually, act? you know, that's a really good point because city council now, the, you know, if we could find a silver lining in the last two and a half years, oh, it's, it's that city council, all of their meetings now it became public. Are, you know, I mean, they've always been public, but who could go down and sit in a room? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now you can zoom in to any committee meeting, yeah. you can testify. You know, you oh, can yeah. sign up to testify mm -hmm. at a meeting. So, you know, if we had to find a silver lining, that's it. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? <clears throat> what percentage of, of people vote in, in, in New York City? Have you any idea? Yes, it's very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, depending on your district, we, what we do is we monitor low turnout districts and that's where we do our like postcarding campaigns and outreach and we try to target some of the low turnout districts. Now we're talking about all of New York City, you know, each individual assembly district or ED, election district, where we would have, let's say, 87% of all eligible voters are registered. Of the registered voters, we've seen turnouts as low as 19%. Citywide, in a presidential year, what, 60 some odd percent? It's pretty, New York it's State so is like number 45 in the country for voter turnout. Oh my God. It's really bad. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're pushing for, is really getting, getting out the vote. It's easy to, you know, in New York, it's pretty easy to register. It's a matter of getting people from the registration to create that voting action plan and follow through. So when we started this evening talking about how do we get folks to vote, that's that's the work. Wow. That's why we gave you all the handouts. Right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we do. Leslie manning these tables yeah. all do you, over. Do you think that having 
like Susan B. Anthony, this, this particular show, having arts events helps to get the vote out? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Whatever it takes. One thing, uh, this was um, early pandemic. I was on a panel sponsored by an organization called Rise to Win, mm -hmm. which is a sports organization that works with professional athletes mm -hmm. in social justice. And I was on a panel on Zoom with four New York Giant football players <laughs> and me, which was hilarious because they filled up their whole little box and I was not filling up my box. But anyway, we were you know, backstage on Zoom and one of the football players said to me, I know that when I put on this uniform, I have a voice and I have a platform. But if I'm just walking down the street as an ordinary black man, he said, I don't have a voice. But in this uniform, I have a voice, I have a platform, and I know I am obligated to use it. So arts, sports, music, whatever we can do to, to bring people to understand what we're talking about and the importance of this and the importance of civics and educating people to their rights and their voice, got to use it. Every weapon in the arsenal, so to speak. And, and as, as, as um, Diane said, right, um, that every, every election matters, every vote matters. And I think in your, in, to your question about the turnout piece of it, we can look across the country and see over and over again in many kinds of races where folks lost by less than, you know what I'm saying, 100 votes, 1,000 votes. And what the consequences of that have brought. So it's, it's not a matter of, oh, somebody else will vote for me. I don't have to worry about it. This is New York. It's, you know, it's going to be fine. That's not where, where we are today. And I think people have to come back to the Susan B. Anthony in them and say, it's my responsibility. It's my job. And that's what it's about. It's not for somebody else to do. I have to do it. I have to be involved in it and bring others with me. So that's what we're hoping to try to inspire folks to do. And as, as, as the artist uh, you are and the folks that we witnessed tonight, we need you to keep on doing that piece of it as well. And for being here with us and, and, and doing this format. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what was that vote that you talked to for the city council for Carolyn Rivera? What is it? What happened? She she said she was going to vote down the tech hub, and then when she got in, she voted for it. What is the tech hub? It's it's a the building on 14th Street that um it's a huge building. It's already up, but I also think can you turn that off? Yeah. Okay.